public policies, exactly. Like that. Uh, so his, his research and development project that he has been working on uh, and developing his drug to Jen now, and uh, I think we need, he, needs a, he deserves a hand. Yes. Just that way I don't have to raise my voice. As you just heard multiple times, I'm Ruben Turok, I consult here at Brazilian. And I'm here today to talk about intelligent procedures. Very excited to present this concept that I've been working on with the people here at Resilient. And well, I can imagine that the first thing that comes to mind when you hear intelligence procedures is what in the world is intelligence procedures? So let me start you off by giving you the academic uh, definition behind this concept. And it's basically defined as the process of aligning our procedures with how the work is done. Or in other words, organizations have expectations of how we want the work to be done, but reality is much messier than that. So these academics that coined this term, intelligence procedures, have been trying to determine how can we make the expectations actually match reality while simultaneously make that reality meet at least our most fundamental expectations as an, or, as an organization. And to dig a bit deeper into the conceptual side of things, I've prepared a graph. So on the one hand, uh, we want to measure the vagueness and strictness of our expectations, or how most of us understand them as in our procedures. And on our y-axis, we want to measure how much people comply or over comply with these expectations. Uh, here, here, uh, I think most of these uh, measurements are quite straightforward. The only one I would maybe uh, scratch on a little bit is this over compliance concept, which basically means that some people will over comply with a procedure even when knowing that might be detrimental to themselves or to the organization. Uh, and if there are more questions about that, we can touch on that a bit later. But basically, the literature uh, recognizes four extreme scenarios that we see in some organizations or a variation of this. The first one of those scenarios is, you can think of a situation where we have a vague procedure, uh, which in turn usually leads to quite a bit of anarchy. We're not giving a lot of guidance to the people doing the work. And on the flip side of that, we can think about a situation where we have very strict procedures, which ironically have the same result. If they are not fit for purpose, if they don't match reality, people tend to throw them away and not listen to what the organization wants. Uh, on the other hand, we can also think about a third scenario where people are more or less doing what's expected of them, but we don't have any guidance in place which leads to a very unaligned way of doing the work. So everyone is doing their own thing. And this might work for a while. It usually doesn't work for a very long time. And the fourth, let's say, a bit extreme scenario, or well, in some situations, they're actually not as extreme as we think. We can actually find this in some organizations. Uh, we have very strict scenarios. We write out these procedures in our ivory tower. We throw them down the pipeline and we just expect everyone to do the work like we want. And sometimes some organizations do achieve this. But if that procedure doesn't fit reality, we are actually doing a disservice to our operations because people will follow these procedures even to their own detriment. And we see this a lot uh, with very top-down heavy organizations where uh, people running the operations are disincentivized to think critically and just adhere to whatever they were told. And uh, obviously you can think about everything in between. This is not so much in the literature, but we can assume we have a situation where we have a quite fit for purpose procedure, but people are still not complying like we would want. And we're probably talking about a situation where we don't have the enforcement mechanisms to make people uh, follow those expectations. Or there are situations where perhaps we're doing a bit, a, a bit better, sorry. Um, but uh, we still notice that people are not able to adapt their decision-making skills, and the procedure doesn't allow for that. And that's something 
we might want to work on. <coughs> Ultimately, the point is always the same. We want to align these two things, and we want to find the balance. Uh, so just on top of this, hopefully the concept is a bit broad, but I've tried to synthesize it as well as I can. Uh, Resilium has taken this concept of intelligence procedure and decided to build a framework on top of it to try and offer a more systematic way to try and broach this challenge that I'm talking about over here. And if I might add something to this to help explain what it is, let me explain to you why we decided to invest time and energy in intelligence procedures uh, and to try and pilot this service with the help of some of our some organizations that have been kind enough to let us in and actually pilot this concept in the real world. Uh, and well, it all comes down to a need that we saw across all the organizations. Obviously some face these challenges that we're talking about more than others, but we all face uh, a level of it. And throughout over, what is it, 30 years of institutional knowledge that we have here at Resilient, uh, we have helped a lot of organizations map out their risk scenarios, identify their key controls, and even though that has been tremendously impactful, uh, we've also realized that a lot of that never gets fully translated into the actual operations. Something that's very common is, is that three years after we helped out, uh, revise their registries or build some bow ties, they'll call us up and say, hey, we had an accident. I guess we didn't foresee this three years ago. We'll go there, we'll look at their bow ties, for example, and it turns out that specific scenario had already been talked about, worked through, but the controls that we had so thoroughly talked about never got put in place. And that happens all the time. And if we're being completely honest with ourselves, a lot of that work that we do finds itself into file cabinets, only to be pulled out once a year, once every two years, uh, when a safety review is coming up, or perhaps when a contractor or a regulator has raised some concerns, or uh, most regretfully, once we've had an incident, like in the example I just gave you. So that's why we went out there to try and find a solution to this ongoing question that we had, how to actually land all the things we were talking about, that we stumbled upon this concept, and that we thought this is pretty, it talks a lot about the things that we're seeing, let's build a framework on top of it and see if we can help organizations deal with this problem. Uh, so now the logical next question is, how are we trying to do this here at Resilient? So I've already uh, hinted that we develop a framework, and the first aspect of this framework uh, came to be by developing three guiding questions. So the first question that the concept doesn't ask, but we came to realize was very important, but often overlooked is, is anyone looking at our procedures? Are people even aware what the expectation is? The second question is very much a hint uh, linked to the concept is, how are we writing these procedures? What, our, what are our expectations? And the third question is, okay, how are people actually doing the work? First of all, are they complying? Second of all, it also helps us realize if our procedures are fit for purpose. Do they match reality? And we believe that by answering those three guiding questions, we are able to come up with concrete recommendations for organizations to try and bridge the gap between expectations and reality. And so, yeah, to explain the second part of the framework we developed beyond these three questions, which are the core of it, uh, let me give you an example. So, we have three organizations, NSG Company, BVP Company, and Kush Company. They've heard about this amazing concept called intelligence procedures. They hear that a company called Resilium um, is working on a framework to try to actually implement the concept, and so they decided to give us a call. And this is where our step-by-step -step part of the framework kicks in. And the first part is, well, selecting a procedure. And uh, having already piloted this, uh, we realized that this was definitely something that we overlooked when we started. Because the scoping, in many ways, determines the success of applying any framework. 
Uh, and the first time we did it, or the first couple of times we did it, we just went there, we started brainstorming, and for example, we just came up with these procedures that we were going to work on, because we do it all the time, so let's just start there. But after several iterations, uh, we actually came up with a criteria. So with these three companies that are calling us up, we're not just going to sit down and brainstorm for three hours, but we actually have a criteria that we've developed that can help us narrow down what procedures might be good candidates to focus on. The first of those criteria is to focus on anything new. Obviously, this can mean some completely new procedure that we have, but most likely in most organizations, it would mean focusing on a procedure that has a new step, a new requirement, or a new tool to it. The second criteria would be to focus anything where we see a lot of complaints. Obviously, it can be from contractors or regulators, but as in the subcontext of all of this, you see I'll, I'll talk a lot about the actual people doing the actual work. So we want to focus on things where people in the operations are complaining about an aspect of a procedure. Uh, the most straightforward criteria is anything where we see a lot of incidents. Obviously, it's a good criteria. And the fourth criteria that we have is anything with a lot of variability. What do we mean by this? Any procedure that we see different levels of performance among different crews, different teams, this might hint at a good procedure we should put more attention to. And with these three uh, companies, when scoping, we realized, for example, that all three of them have incorporated a new crane. And they want to see, do people know how to operate this new tool? Uh, another thing that we find in these three companies is that all three of them are complaining, are receiving a lot of complaints when it comes to working at height from many of their technicians. All three of them uh, see that they see a lot of incidents regarding sleeping in some workspaces, and all three of them, just to exemplify this criteria, they see that different teams are performing differently when it comes to cyber, cyber security breaches, and they want to try and understand why that might be. And even though all these four uh, examples would qualify as good procedures to focus on, we also encourage uh, companies or challenge companies to come up with a procedure that meet one or uh, multiple of these criteria. And luckily for me, and for the sake of this example, all these the three companies share one procedure that have new steps and tools uh, in them. They have a lot of complaints, they see uh, a rise in incidents, and they see a lot of variability in the performance. And in this case, we're talking about working with chainsaws. So once we scoped the procedure and selected it, we move on to the analysis phase of intelligence procedures. And to do that, we implement all the qualitative and quantitative tools at our disposal <coughs> to try and answer our three guiding questions that I talked about a couple of slides before. But don't worry, I'll be repeating them in case you've forgotten them. And by answering those questions and coming to some initial conclusions, we hope to come up with concrete recommendations that we can test and pilot to see their impact. And we're back to our graph. So let's assume that we start with our first co company, NSG company. And as I just mentioned, we answer our three questions. Is anyone looking at the procedure? How are the procedures written? And how are procedures actually being done? So on the first question, we verify that indeed everyone is looking at it. So in a way that's good. We also recognize that it's a very strict procedure which in turn has turned people off to even looking at it. It's not fit for purpose. Hence, people decide to ignore it. And that explains where it has landed. And in case you were wondering what NSG company stands for, well, it stands for not so great company. <laughs> so, so what do we do now with this information? Well, obviously we have to rethink our procedure, because that's not where any company wants to be. And in this case, we probably would start off by recommending something like, we're obviously not getting enough feedback from the people on the ground, from reality. So let's just get those people in the room. Let's rethink our risk scenarios. And just by doing that, 
we might begin to see some real uh, exponential effects. In this case, perhaps we'll end up determining, let's have a less strict procedure, perhaps, which is not necessarily the case. Maybe we just have to have a strict procedure, but, it, but that it is fit for purpose, for example. And anyhow, we see those improvements, and they do so well that they decide to rebrand to a little better company. Uh, and now we move on to our second company, just to continue to drive this point of how we would go about doing this. We, we need to get under control. That's not part of the presentation, but uh, anyone can. Ah, there we go. All right. Thanks, Alex. Uh, we once again ask the three questions. Is anyone looking at the procedure? In this case, we realize that they're not. So some people might say, well, that's good enough for me. We don't need anything more. How can we get them to read the procedures? But I think it's when we've piloted this program and we've had this type of initial result, it's still worth going through, it's still worth going through the motions. So how are the procedures written? We find out that the procedures are very vague, very bulky. Something very common is that procedures are written for regulators, just for compliance. We see that all the time. It does nothing for the actual work but companies are happy because the regulators are happy, which also speaks to the regulators who <coughs> care more about how people are actually using this. And, well, how are the procedures done? You know, obviously, there's a lot of anarchy. People don't have very little guidance on how to do the work. And even worse, even the most fundamental aspects of safety are not followed because research shows that when people don't understand a procedure or they discard a procedure, they're obviously not going to discard it selectively. So in those type of situations, we see that people, a lot of the time, don't even fulfill like the most safety, the most basic safety uh, procedures. In this case, we're talking about, for example, not using basic PPE. So we move on. Oh yeah, I forget my little joke here. BVP company, in case you were wondering, it means very vague procedures company we should have, have hinted at what the problem was, but we still decided to look into it. So again, we rethink our procedures. So what do we have to do to make this workable? Uh, first of all, we probably wanna say, okay, before we even think about the procedure, let's make sure that people do at least the most basic things. For example, using PPE. Uh, and that immediately will probably see an improvement in how we do the work. Uh, but it's also important to recognize that not everyone out there is a reader and that especially nowadays there's so many ways to get information out there. So a tool that people have been, has been drawing a lot of interest is these new e-learning tools that are actually designed specifically for safety that make it much easier for people to learn about how to do certain activities or do certain tasks. And uh, of course this would also have an impact but ultimately, I think we would all agree that just making sure that people are digesting some of the information that we want them to digest as an organization, that we're going to see uh, significant improvements. And this company, after testing this out and seeing, oh, we're doing much better, also decides to rebrand to dynamic working procedures, which might be a little, of a, a little bit of a stretch, but that's what they go for. And Hopefully this has it's become a bit redundant, but uh, we talked about Kush Company, which is our last company. As we can see, they don't start off as extreme as the other two. We go through the three questions that by now, I think, uh, we all remember. Uh, we testify that they all read it. Uh, we come to the determination that perhaps it's a little bit more strict <laughs> that we would like. And what we actually find in this organization is that the reason that we might not be, we might not be performing like we want to is because with this ch new chainsaw that we incorporated, the older crew is actually performing much worse than the newer crew that is more comfortable with the newer chainsaws. And what happened? Uh, and the name is could use some help could use some help company. And what happens here? And this. Are, all the three are actually based in real cases, but in this particular one, a lot of organizations just 
never get any feedback from the workforce. They just insert new tools. And this is a clear example where they think they're making people safer, but, but, but by forcing a new tool on them, well, they're actually putting people at risk. So let's rethink, tweak a little bit our procedures. In this case, that probably will mean giving the older workforce a bit more of op a bit more options, like for example, going back to the older chainsaw. Again, this tool is very popular, but giving them tools to learn how to use a new tool. And also perhaps recommending that the organization uh, move people around. So perhaps the older crew can learn from the new crew how to use the new chainsaw over time and eventually achieving intelligence procedures. So uh, the framework seems a bit vague at times. It's quite flexible, but the challenges that we face are quite flexible. So if the concept has been a bit heavy to understand at times, or if you just leave today and perhaps don't remember everything that I've said, I do want to leave you with three takeaways. Uh, the first one is, ask yourselves these three questions about your procedures. Are people looking at them? How are we writing them? And how is the work actually done? My second takeaway that I want you to take home is be proactive with your safety. Don't wait to call us to do something about it. And the third takeaway is we are all a crush company in the best of scenarios. All, everything in safety is perfectible, so please don't hesitate to give us a call and perhaps we can discuss this concept in more detail. Thank you very much. Four minutes. Is there room for two questions? curious to see which uh, procedures were selected uh, and tested because at our company we do the lifting operations and yeah and indeed what you say it's all about uh, selecting the right procedure uh, afterwards uh, looking back i think i would have benefited from uh, uh, for instance the restricted areas or the confined spaces which is uh, quite a problem for people to understand because the procedures are so long so i think uh, visualizing uh, what needs to be done would definitely be, uh, be beneficial. But what other procedures are, 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 would you say, are beneficial for people? Or that, does that depend on company? I mean, I, I would say it completely depends on the company. But uh, some that we've seen is confined spaces keeps coming up in a lot of organizations. Uh, and things like new tools, I think, is where uh, people that have employed this as well have found a lot of success when applying this type of concepts. Because especially now we think new tool, modern, always better. And when you actually talk to the people on the ground, you come to realize that's not the case. Those are a couple of examples, but again, it does depend on each and every organization. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, yeah. And I also recall uh, the case, uh, I think it was a shutdown scenario of a plant. And in the end, there was only one person who was, I think, one or two years before his retirement, who knew how to do it. And it was not written anywhere, sort of. And said, well, that might be a good candidate to select uh, for my... So, so it, I would say, just go in an organization and ask, okay, guys, which activities aren't we so sure that if our experienced people go away, that there is someone else who can perform it as desired. And something I might have missed when explaining the concept and the framework is this variability part where sometimes we also lack the opportunity to learn about best practices. So I just quickly touched on the cybersecurity example, but if we don't ask ourselves not only what people are doing wrong, but what people might be, some people might be doing particularly well, we are losing a lot of information out there. This is part of it. Great. Thanks. Thanks again. Thanks again.